After five months of organizing, my channel is finally out of the oven, and so far I have posted three videos, and I did promise a special video of what I've been playing in the last month. So I guess it's now time for me to spill the sauce and talk about what I've been playing. Now remember, these are my opinions, and sometimes there might be some spoilers along the way. So here are the games that I've been playing, and their designated times in this video. Welcome back to the HUD everyone. I'm Zaccaroni, and today I'll be going through some of the games I have been playing through January to May. So without further ado, please be seated, and here comes your second helpings. At first, I was not excited about Celeste because of how similar it plays to Super Meat Boy. But I do love me a good 2D side-scroller, and if it's going to be similar to it, I might as well give it a chance, really. But what really surprised me was that there's an actual story in the game. You see, you follow Madeline, a young redhead girl who is climbing up a mountain named Celeste, hint the title. While the premise is simple, it's Madeline's ambitions that are the most interesting. You see, she is not a girl who is adventurous and excited, Instead, she is sort of nervous, and because of her mental health problems, she believes that if she can do this, she can get over them. And every time I see her panicked face, and hear her squeaky but petrified voice, I ended up caring for her because of how innocent she feels. It gave me a reason to see her story through, and boy did I feel glad I did. Each chapter feels like a true reflex challenge that pushes me to time that perfect jump and still feel like I accomplished something, just like how Madeline is, and it's all backed up by a soundtrack that matches the pacing and storytelling. Once I completed the game, I came back to it often to find all the hidden tape sets, which unlock more levels that are more challenging. Some of them takes an hour to complete, but I didn't find them cheap, and most of the mistakes were my fault. In fact, the footage that you are seeing right now was bad timings and mess ups that were done by my actions because of how tight the controls are. Overall, Celeste is my most surprising game I have played this year. With its created level design, secret to discover, a story worth inventing, and a character I could easily relate to. It should go to show you that if something looks familiar to what you played before, there's always that little extra stuffing that it tucked inside. When Nino Kuni was first announced, I was immediately on board with this because I enjoyed the first game with its story, combat system, and it got me into Studio Ghibli and anime. But when I heard that Studio Ghibli was not involved with this one, I was starting to speculate on how will Level 5 pull this off without Ghibli. The third thing that changed was the combat system, where it's more focused on action, where I can do a chain of light and heavy attacks, and somehow, I actually enjoyed this, but it's not quite as beefy as other action RPGs like Kingdom Hearts. Although, the game didn't give me a challenge, and I didn't fail on my first attempt at the main bosses. It's all backed up by the tactic tweaker, where I can increase my attack power to one enemy type, and that's when I discovered that I can just go through the main quest without leveling up too much. Next up is the kingdom building management, where I get to build Evan's kingdom called Evermore. However, this feature is only used to improve my characters and to gain better armor and items, which made the game more easier. But I kinda didn't use my shop that much because the game is still too easy. Plus, I can just find better armor and items around the world, really. As for the kingdom battles, well, while the rock paper scissors format is interesting, it's not really that fun to play, and I ended up going straight into a group of enemies and still win without thinking of a strategy, and also there was one kingdom battle that took me a dozen attempts to complete. I mean, how many hits did this guy take before he gets away out of the blue? The story meanwhile started off promising, 
with Roland, who turned out to be the President of the United States, get transported and turn younger to Evansville after the city he was visited got nuked. So I'm guessing that World War 3 has already begun in his world. But hey, at least he's got a sidearm for self-defense, just like every leader should have for emergencies. Just saying, really. Anyway. Then it got more deeper when Roland teached Evan what it means to rule a nation, and when they start visiting the other kingdoms to sign a peace treaty, they discover that the rulers have been corrupted by a new villain named Dolorin. While the story is interesting, and the interactions between Roland and Evan are memorable, I actually preferred the first game story, where the kingdoms weren't corrupted by evil, they were broken hearted, as in, their one personality that made them who they are, like enthusiasm or kindness, were taken away from them. And the main character has a better and personal quest, unlike Evan, whose personal goal is to build a kingdom that everyone can live happily ever after, which is questionable to why somebody like him at his age would do something like that. Overall, Nino Kuni 2 is a good sequel with a better combat system, and the tactic tweaker is a new helpful addition to the genre. But its story is not quite there, and the other features seem unnecessary, even though it fits into the story. Now you might be looking at your monitors, tablets, or phones, and you are probably going to say, you haven't done a toppings video on this. Well, this game is published by Nintendo, and we all know that YouTube and Nintendo don't really get along with each other but I really want to talk about Nintendo games on this channel. So in response to this, I'll be showing random images that represent the game while talking over it. And because of that, I won't be doing any topping videos for Nintendo games because of their YouTube policy. So now that's out of the way, let's begin. The only Kirby games I have ever played are Epic Yarn and Planet Robobot which was the first true Kirby game I played compared to the last one. Now his next adventure is on the Switch, and I needed something to play while I'm on holiday. So here's what I think of it. Star Allies plays similar to past Kirby games. He can jump multiple times, suck up enemies, spit them out, or copy their abilities, complete with their own movesets like Staff Kirby, who can use his staff as a pogo stick followed up by multiple jabs while in the air. This is my favorite copy ability in the game. It got good range and it extremely powerful, and that's what made these games fun to play. Besides from sucking up enemies, he can also make them join his side by throwing a heart at them, which is not evil by the way. He can have up to three allies and he can combine elements with allies that have melee weapons like fire, ice, and electricity. And somewhere down the line, you'll need all your allies to help you in certain sections, like forming a bridge to escort an NPC, or forming a wheel to wreak havoc in Dreamland. The game was easy at first, but later it got difficult in the fourth world, and this forced me to choose allies that play a supportive role, like Chef Kawasaki, who can summon food to heal allies in battle and elemental allies that can do more damage to the element that it's strong against. After I completed the main campaign, I decided to check out the other modes in the game. Chomp Champs and Star Slam Heroes are ideal to play with friends rather than on my own. However, the other two modes are right up my alley. Get Star mode is Time Attack, where you pick a character who is not Kirby, while the ultimate choice is Boss Rush mode, where you choose a range of Kirbys, three allies to fight alongside you, and then you set the difficulty that shows Kirby with a Mio and a chili sauce that change his facial expression the higher you set it to. The one big feature that I didn't talk about is local co-op with three other players. However, I didn't have a chance since I was on holiday, so I'll have to make this into a two-part. But so far, it controls well, and it featured great sections like changing into a friend's wheel, but I think I'll find it more fun if I had three friends to play with. When the new God of War was first shown to the public, a lot of gamers were spectacle on the new perspective for the series, including me. 
I mean, a third-person hack-and-slash game where Kratos can only attack where the camera is facing at. That's got to make some problems, but we'll talk about it later. The only reason I played it for was the story. While Kratos is a fun character to play as, I also find him as a frustrating character to cope with because of how angry he is all the time. And I understand he's supposed to be like that, but he's just lacking personality inside himself. Now in this game, he's finally got some character development, and he's now a bit less angry than last time. Which I kind of like because he now knows when to get angry and how to use it in a serious situation. But the highlight of the story is his relationship with his son, Atreus. At first, they don't get along that well, but a few hours later, they started to connect with each other. Like in one moment where Kratos said that they are going to take down this monster because Atreus is frightened of it. And this is what I like because it's proving that he is trying to be a special dad to him. On to the gameplay. Now, I can see this into a 100% opinion stat, separated into three preferences. With 60% of gamers saying that the combat system is a huge letdown from previous installments. 25% of gamers would say that it's good but not that memorable than previous games. And 15% of gamers would say that the combat system is a new step forward for the franchise. And where do I stand? Well, I would be one of the 25% of gamers because it's more tactical than the previous games, even though the controls are a little tricky to use. But in the end, I got used to them. And in Son Atreus, it's really helpful. Not only with firing arrows at enemies, but also holding them in place for me to finish them off. Although, I wish the perspective was a lot different, more like Uncharted or Arkham, and less than Dead Space, if you know what I mean. While it makes sense for franchises like Resident Evil, Zelda, and Doom should evolve for a new generation of gamers, God of War should have gone for a perspective that would please longtime fans as well as new gamers. But overall, I find the game fun to play, and the main character is now likeable to root for but I don't think it's the best game in the franchise. Alright, that's all the games I've been playing between January to May. I hope you appreciate my opinions, and if you like what you see, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Until then, I'm Zaccaroni. Enjoy your pizza, and I'll see you next time.